You're listening to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast with the LJC Chief Community Officer, Monique Ramsey. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast. I'm your hostess, Monique Ramsey. And I am so excited about today because we are being joined by the CEO of La Jolla Cosmetic, Marie Olison. And I'm going to let her just tell you a little bit. It's like, how do you introduce somebody who, you know, has such a profound impact on your day-to-day life and, and our workplace? So I'm going to let her just tell you a little bit about herself. Welcome, Marie. Thank you, Monique. I'm very glad to be here. Well, so tell us a little bit about your role at La Jolla Cosmetic and other companies that you've founded. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to go back to when I was 12 years old and I went to my first Disneyland visit. And I was unhappy with the shuttle service. And so in my little child's handwriting, I filled out a form and made a complaint. And the manager of the Disneyland Hotel wrote to me and said, we're very sorry that the shuttle service was not working to your standards. We're new here and we have some things to work out, but we are fixing that. And let me know when you'll be back. And from that, really developed my life with a passion for customer service and for organizations that take care of their customers. And even today in the world of ratings and reviews, I say that how Disneyland handled that was perfect. They apologized. They acknowledged that they had a problem. They assured me they were going to fix it. And they presumed that it would not break our relationship because I had an imperfect experience. And I think that that is really true of us today as customers, whether it's in medicine or when we're buying a car or we're going shopping. We're looking for kindness, concern, courtesy, and competence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, I, I saw in your LinkedIn bio a copy of that letter dated September 29th, 1956. Right. And I love the fact that, like you say, they acknowledged, they thanked you, and they admitted that things weren't perfect in their first year of operation and that they're going to improve. But I love the way they closed it out. Please let me know when to expect you because they, they're they already saying, you know, we're going to fix it and we think you're going to come back. And so I thought that was really neat. So we'll put a link in the show notes to the letter because it's really cute. So you're not only the CEO of La Jolla Cosmetic, but you also founded a few companies. One is Inform and Enhance and also Real Patient Ratings. So could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. I went to work for my first doctor when I was 18 years old. And I decided then that I wanted my life's work to be helping good doctors take better care of patients. And at the time, this is the early 60s, and my parents hadn't gone to college. And so for me to think of being a doctor was really out of my realm. But to think that I could help doctors, I thought I certainly could do that. And so for many years, that's what I did. But then Dr. Olison and I wrote Cosmetic Surgery for Dummies. And by then we realized this is the early 2000s that patients really didn't know how to find the good doctors. So in addition to helping doctors take better care of their patients, I realized that both the patients and the good doctors needed help finding each other. Mm -hmm. And that my 36 pages of medical specialization really didn't help anybody, but helping people write ratings about doctors and then publishing those in a way that patients could find them and trust them then that led me to that second part of my life. And that passion really does show in everything. I think that everyone at La Jolla Cosmetic does, you know, and that's always the top down thing, that passion for service and service excellence. And, you know, not just the typical medical institution, you know, right? very different in terms of how we see ourselves and our patients and how we deliver care. So 
let's go back to when you very first began working in the practice and what was your role? Well, I was helping Dr. Olison and his then partner establish the center. So I didn't work for them, but on the outside of choosing the decor, helping them choose the location. And I started serving patients early in that process, probably 1988. And the first responses that came back were just startling to us. And you have to remember, this is 1988, so it's pre-internet. And people didn't have ways to find out medical information. They didn't have access to a lot of things that we consider normal now. So in the first surveys, one came back and a patient described herself as feeling through the surgical process that she was in a dark tunnel. And I'm claustrophobic, so nothing could be a worse image for me than a dark tunnel. And I didn't want anyone to experience that. And then secondly, one of the patients said, Dr. Olison liked me until he did my surgery, then he dropped me. And again, this is before people really understood the patient's emotional needs going through a cosmetic surgery experience. And frankly, he hadn't been trained for it at all. And so he's a very nice man. He's very kind. He's a real, it was a really good surgeon. And so once he identified that there was a need that he hadn't understood, then of course he wanted to fill that need. And so we have been surveying our patients for 33 years. Mm-hmm. And that's really the only way to grow. And that's sort of taking a tip from Disneyland. You know, they said our services needed improvement and we're working to correct that. I know you share on a daily basis as our people give us a review on Google or in real patient ratings or on Facebook, you're sharing those every single day with the staff. And I think, you know, if, if there's a score that's less than perfect, it's not like you said, I think, using it as a hammer. It's more about learning from that and how do we fix it? Right, exactly. And <laughs> when I first started, our average patient, let's say she's in her 20s, could have been my child. But now she could be my grandchild. And so how do you, as a leader of an organization, where the consumer's changing and evolving, how do you keep up with their needs and their changing expectations? And the only way you can do that is by continuing to ask them. Mm -hmm. And so back in that, you know, 1988, what made you think of having a survey to go to the patients in the first place? I know one thing that happened. So we did an office that we thought would be what our patients would want. And so we did this beautiful office down in La Jolla, an old building. I told the designer to make it look like a European hotel, timeless. And then we started marketing and we started advertising and somebody came in and they looked around and they said, I'm not paying for this. (laughs) And I went, whoa. And then someone else, we had a typical four page medical history and somebody else threw the medical history back at the receptionist and said, I'm not filling this out. I haven't even decided if I'm going to hire you. Um. And I went, whoa, (laughs) we're in a different world and we better figure out since our desire is to serve and our desire is to provide quality we better figure out what our consumer wants. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about back then you were saying marketing. So, you know, that was really in the eighties for a long time, doctors weren't even allowed to market. And then the government changed the rules and allowed them to market. But really, I think in 88, when we were starting, was anybody else even marketing? A few people were marketing. Most of them were not board certified plastic surgeons. This is before the days when surgery centers were required to be licensed or accredited. Mm -hmm. So I remember one person described that their recovery room bed was in the hall next to the receptionist. And so it was sort of the Wild West. So that bed wasn't in 
our facility, right? Oh, no, 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 (laughs) no. But I'm telling you that that's what we were competing with. And we thought that that was wrong. And Mm -hmm. so we did a Medicare certified OR. We got board certified anesthesiologists. We did everything right. Mm -hmm. And then we went about in our marketing to teach the consumer what to look for. And the sad part is they were great ads. And my husband got called up before the California Society for advertising. And he went on this panel and he said, I sort of feel like I'm on a do you beat your wife panel. I'm not sure that I can give you an answer that you're going to want to hear. But his answer was many, many people are choosing physicians and surgeons off of inadequate information and they don't necessarily have the medical connections to get a recommendation from a physician, which was sort of the path in those days. And so we just regarded it as a public service and that we were going to be transparent, we were going to be friendly, and we were going to be safe and great experiences and surgical quality. One thing I remember seeing is that really you guys, whether it was a print ad or it was in the yellow pages back in the day. And people really, you know, you're in the yellow pages, but nobody wants to say that they found you in the yellow pages. Whereas now Google, everybody Googles everything. And, you know, they're on the web and they do all this investigation of their perspective doctor. But one of the things that I remember you did was before the term infomercial was an actual term, you all did 30 minute TV segments to really talk about each procedure and you'd have a guest on there, maybe a patient and they'd have somebody interviewing the doctors. And what do you remember about that? I remember they were very successful, wildly successful. It was a little cable show. So they were just on one of the cable channels, but the doctors were stiff. You know, nobody (laughs) knew how to, how to be on screen in a comfortable way, but they were still very valuable. And they got to know us in a way that now you can get to know someone through social media or something, watching videos or even podcasts, you know, but with much more limited opportunities in those days. And for those of you who are listening and don't necessarily know who Dr. Olison is, he's your husband. He's the founder of La Jolla Cosmetic, board certified plastic surgeon and otolaryngologist. So he's double board certified and he's retired. So... We miss him dearly, but he pops in with his coffee and says hello. (laughs) And I think the reason the center started was he was at Scripps Clinic, I believe. Right. And tell us about the transition. He was chief of plastic surgery at Scripps Clinic, and he had a very large cosmetic practice. And as part of cosmetic surgery consideration, you have to get a fee quote. And it's a pretty private moment for someone to be telling in a public setting what you want and how much it's going to cost. And so at the clinic, there was a bullpen of secretaries. And so the patient had to sit there with other people listening to hear the price and have the procedure discussed. And the staffing at the clinic wasn't what he needed in his mind, to take optimal care of the aesthetic patient. So he wanted more nurses or he wanted better nurses. And so we were paying nurses under the table to get them to stay in plastic surgery. And the clinic had like 250,000 patients at that point. And they were actively marketing for HMO patients. So he went to the clinic and he said, I need a separate entrance. I can't have my patients in the same lobby with really sick people. It's very discouraging to them. I need more nursing staff. I need private spaces. And so he just outlined what he needed. And they basically said no and go write a book because they were they were (laughs) upset because he didn't publish. And it just led to him deciding to leave. And his vision for how to take care of the aesthetic patient and how to have a team take care of the patient. And we've been team-based really since we were founded. And our early ads 
one of our headlines was excellence in plastic surgery takes teamwork. And to help the patients understand this isn't something to fear. You're going to have a whole team of people taking care of you. And everybody's a competent professional in their own right for their part of this experience and service that you're going to receive. Wonderful. I love hearing the blast from the past. (laughs) And we do have on the website, there's some of the history and some pictures of the old building and the team that you guys can all check out. We'll put some links in the notes. So one of the things that going back before Google, you know, how did people find plastic surgeons or how did they even know if a surgeon was right for them? And is that part of the education that you talked about? Yes. And again, taking everybody back to the 80s, the newspapers were huge. We're very successful. We had large newspaper campaign. Magazines worked in those days, though not as well. And when a new patient called us, we decided we did a survey of, you know, sort of what's happening in our community. And so we found out that when patients called for an appointment, that in most practices, they made the appointment and they didn't send them any information. So we decided, okay, at that first step, we're going to be different. And we're going to send a letter from the doctor, and we're going to send some information about the procedure and information about the safety in our practice. And so that was the beginning. And I came across one of those letters the other day, and I thought, my God, we used to print these and put them in an envelope and mail them. That's Mm -hmm. how we communicated. Mm-hmm. So part of the background or the of the center or the history is, you know, that award-winning care. And we really have won a lot of awards now coming, like fast mm-hmm. forwarding to now, 20 Best of San Diego Awards. And pretty much since they started the category for Best Medical Spa, since they started the category for Best Cosmetic Surgeon or Cosmetic Surgery Group, you know, so we have a little hall of fame or wall of fame with the plaques at the center. And I remember hearing a doctor say, well, this is not that important. And I thought, no, it may not be important to you as a surgeon, but it's important to the consumer. And that's really what it is. It, I mean, how do you see those awards? I see them as a, a form of validation. If we say we're really good and we're going to take very good care of you. People go, yeah, that's nice. But there's a statistic that says what other people say about you is 12 times more believable than what you say about yourself. So I think that the awards really matter. And once I realized that patients really had a hard time discerning proper training and excellence in plastic surgery, that then that's why ratings and reviews would matter again, because it's what someone else is saying about us. Mm -hmm. And we surveyed the patients, as I said, from 88, and they had little paper forms. And we had a three ring binder in our waiting room of hundreds and hundreds of patient responses. And people would sit and read those just like they read ratings and reviews now. And it's just hard to fake that much happiness. (laughs) (laughs) happiness. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and one of the ones that now we're moved to big time, you know, from San Diego, best in San Diego. So last year, they're called My Face, My Body. They gave us the best cosmetic plastic surgery practice in the USA. And then against all the other places around the world, we won the same award. So best cosmetic surgery practice on the planet. (laughs) So tell us about that and, you know, a little bit about that group. Well, they're very well respected. They're based in England. They're on all the continents. They deal with med spas and surgical practices in a number of specialties. So we won the award for cosmetic plastic surgery and they have very high standards. And so we were very in sync with them because we think similarly to what they do. And they're really trying to raise the bar in what it takes to receive an award from them and understand as we do that then the true beneficiary of that excellence is the patient themselves. And it's a wonderful group and a very big honor. Yeah, and we, 
I think now we've got eight total awards, seven of them outright wins over the last three years. And so it's just another thing. And you can come and visit our trophies when you come in the office. But, you know, it's good, I think, for the staff. So a source of pride where we work, the doctors are the best, you know, not just in our own opinion, like we think it, but also in the mind of our patients and the, the general public and certifying bodies like My Face, My Body. So if you could explain a little bit, when they go on the website and they see the numbers next to the provider's name, you know, patient satisfaction score, what do those numbers mean? If you could explain that. Sure. It's a cumulative score of their interactions with their patients. So when I founded Real Patient Ratings, my background for many years that I, I had been a consultant to other practices. And so I was used to using data to evaluate practice quality. And so I decided that when someone gave a rating and review, we just didn't want a few words. We wanted to know who the provider was, who the practice was, what the procedure was, so that we could then take that and accumulate those scores. And so if you look on ljcsc.com and you go to the individual provider, that's all the reviews that they have received from patients in our practice across all the procedures that they have done. And if you go to a procedure page and say, let's say you go to the Botox page, now, that is all the Botox delivered to all patients in our practice who completed a rating and review for Botox. And so that's the aggregate score of everyone in the practice providing Botox. So really, it's not just by provider or as a group, but by procedure. So you could right. say, okay, what are the breast augmentation satisfaction right. rates at La Jolla Cosmetics. Correct. And I think that really differentiates from other practices. Well, if someone were thinking of coming to our practice and let's say they go online and they look at real self and they look at, I don't know the right number, but let's say they look for a device and the satisfaction according to real self is 78%. Oh, we came up with this the other day. We saw this, right? Right. This was under, I think, all therapy. And we were discussing all therapy and the satisfaction scores because I think in real self, it was in the high 70s, maybe. Correct. Or? Right. Ours was in the 90s. Uh huh. And so what we're doing there is helping the consumer because the aggregate score on devices is a reflection of the quality of the providers. Mm -hmm. It's not just a score about the device. Right, how you use that device. Exactly. And so if you have better trained providers or higher quality providers, and they're getting ratings individually on their use of that device, it creates an awareness on their part that I think will demonstrably improve satisfaction for the patient. And I was looking at the, the stats. We have over 7,000 reviews now, I think, mm -hmm. on real patient ratings and over 5,000 five-star. I don't know the numbers, but I think we're over 6,500 and we're over, up to almost 10,000 with all sites. Wow. Of those that are five-star, it's a pretty high percentage. It's in the mid 80s. Wow. And then if you take the five highly satisfied and the satisfied, it's over 96. Wow. That's so exciting. And so it was, I was looking at my phone just a second ago because I get these notifications when somebody posts on Google. So literally just now we had a patient post, Kelly, I won't wash well, her names on the post, but I'll just read. Kelly just said, I've been going here for years and have always had a great experience. I would only trust the best in the industry with procedures on my face. I only want the most natural look to stop the signs of aging. Don't we all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Kelly. I just had a filler under my eyes and in tiny amount in my lips. I was so scared because I don't want the duck lip look. Yeah. My look is so natural that only I really know the difference. And that's what I'm looking for. Being a part of the Glam Fam is also such a great deal if you go in more than twice a year. So fun to see these things pop up. Yes, wonderful. Yeah. Okay, so let's also now go back in time again to when we were founded in 1988. 
okay, so there were computers, but no smartphones. People couldn't carry them around. I think the first website that we had, and we were early, it was about 1995. And it was like a little page that San Diego Magazine made for us. <laughs> you know, yeah. We'll build out your website for free if you put an ad in our paper. And then I think we then took that over ourselves in 1996. And that's when we moved into Zymed. So that was when we really started. How has the center grown and changed over the years from maybe those early days on Prospect Street to now? Well, we were mostly a surgical practice. And then we tried dermatology because we realized our plastic surgeons weren't particularly interested in doing lasers and, and our patients had needs for what ultimately became med spa procedures. And so dermatology it didn't work for us. And I can remember it, it because the decision between the dermatologist and the surgeon was what goes first. And do you bake the cake, which is surgery and ice it? And <laughs> the dermatologist would do the skin first. And then the patient would be maybe not as happy as they would be because they had too much skin and they needed skin to be removed first. And I can remember Dr. Olison saying to one of the dermatologists, if your dress is too big and wrinkled, do you really think ironing it is going to help? And I thought, what a great analogy. You have to do first what solves, you know, presuming the patient agrees, obviously, but what solves the biggest problem? Mm -hmm. And so we now, in 2013, established a med spa, and it has been just wonderful for our patients. And seeing into the future, it's clear that that's going to be a big and important part of our business. And so now we are in the works to expand into the North County to add another location because our patients are coming from so far. Yeah, that's so exciting. And I would say the med spa procedures and the technologies are incredible. I think it's wonderful because we have that concept of everything under one roof. Mm -hmm. And you may not know what you need. You might just say, gosh, I really hate my neck. What do I do? And there might be seven ways to solve it in the med spa. There might be four ways to solve it in the surgery center. And you can kind of give yourself to the center and let them help you make the right decision for you. And I think that term of, what is it? When, when all you have is a hammer, then all the world's a nail. Right. So if you have one laser, <laughs> then of course you're going to recommend that one laser to everybody. Right. And in truth, no matter how much cosmetic surgery and med spa procedures are done, people are still scared to start on this journey. And we have our brand promise, which is where dreams become real. And we see ourselves as the trusted people who can help you evaluate your options. And people have their own, you know, limitations or regulations like I don't want surgery or I'm happy to consider surgical procedure. And so then you have to take their input and then you have to say, well, here's the options we have available within your own criteria. Mm -hmm. Whether it's time off or it's budget related or. Exactly. And so I think that one of the things we're most proud of is that concept of under one roof. And we have patients move backwards and forwards between the two all the time. We had one recently with Dr. Brahmi where a patient came to him to see about having her eyes done. It's called a blepharoplasty. And he said, you know, you don't really need a blepharoplasty. He said, I'm going to refer you up to the med spa. And I think just a little laser on your lower lids is all you need at this point. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a review saying that. What honest people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. Yeah. I mean, you want to know that people can trust the advice. And I think that's so true. If Why do something that's not needed? Right. 
And it's really about long-term. I mean, now with almost, we're coming up on 34 years, we have generations of patients and Mm -hmm. their friends and, you know, they come back, they say, oh, I had my breast done 20 years ago and I'm ready to change the implants or change my face now, you know? So it's really, it's, it's really nice. One thing, you know, we always have people who are interested in joining our team. So what do you look for when looking for people to join the team, whether it's a doctor, whether it's a nurse, whether it's a front desk receptionist, you know, what are some qualities that you look for? Someone who's willing to work as a part of a team. And sometimes people are sort of, they just want to do things on their own. And we we had a funny conversation about this this morning because we're looking at hiring someone new for our contact center. And one of the team that was thinking about this said, I like vanilla people the best. And we all started laughing and saying, if you named a spice or if you named an ice cream, does it sound good to be vanilla? And what, <laughs> what do we mean by being vanilla? Which is a kind of neutrality and a softness and not bringing any chaos to work. (laughs) Just come and help us take care of patients. We don't need high maintenance staff because our greater responsibility is to take care of the patients and their needs. And so I have a very strong belief that what comes from management must be kind and must be reasonable. And if I'm having a temper tantrum in the morning, what do you think is going to happen to patient care all day? Mm -hmm. Everybody will be all upset. And I've learned over the years that there's a way to say the same thing. If I identify a problem, to get the problem resolved in a way that doesn't set everybody off and undermine everything we're doing for the day. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the reasons I share all the ratings and reviews, because I want everyone to be reminded all day how happy we make patients. And one of the words that I love to hear them say is comfortable, Mm -hmm. because to come into a scary environment. And it's pretty scary to start talking about your fondest hopes and dreams to a stranger Mm. and to know that they can reach the point that they're comfortable, that they just relax enough, that they're going to be able to hear what's said, to have a good conversation about whatever they're considering. And it's a very human need Mm -hmm. to be comfortable when you're embarking on something that's a big decision. And I I remember years ago, you saying patients come in and they take the emotional temperature of the place. We Mm -hmm. we all do that, whether we're walking into a friend's home or we're walking into a doctor's office or a a business, but that's true. You can pick up that vibe if it's tense, if it's Mm -hmm. tense and Mm -hmm. upsetting. I think back on prospect and one day we would have some doctors locally they sometimes used our ORs because we had three. And so sometimes they weren't all being used at the same time. And we had this surgeon visiting. And of course, back then on Prospect, you had to move your car every two hours because the, the meter maids would come around. And so this physician came and she threw her keys, her car keys at us at the front desk. I happened to be there. She threw her car keys and she said, move my car because she was going to be in surgery for the next however long. And it was like, that's a great way to start your day. (laughs) You know, it was like, oh my God. And I have to think, you know, you hear random stories about doctors who throw instruments in the OR or have a, have a temper, you know, our doctors are so kind. And so, you know, our staff is so kind, but really we work for doctors who are very, very kind people. And it's important that they do good work, but it's also really nice that they're emotionally stable and and fun to work with. And it's an honor to work with them. And so, you know, and as we've added doctors throughout the years, I feel like you guys have done a great job in vetting very nice people. Well, you know, one of the observations I made recently is all of our doctors are happily married. And there was one once who it became apparent within a week that he was going to be a predator on the nurses. And I mean, he was gone. My husband just said, this is unacceptable. And 
I would say emotionally clean environment. But the other thing I'm known for is physically clean. I am a manic about cleanliness. And here we are in Zymed, nine stories of offices. And we literally are the only office that has a cleaning crew come in every weekend and clean our offices. And years ago, someone wrote a survey and they said, what was the final reason that you chose us? And they said, well, the office was so clean that I knew the OR had to be clean. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you don't know how to make a decision about quality of something as complicated as surgery, but you can figure out if they're nice and if the place is clean and if you're having a good experience. And all of that takes an enormous amount of organization and follow through to deliver consistently. And so I think of that there's a lot of quiet clues that people pick up mm-hmm. that they may not even realize that they're seeing and that it's influencing them, but it's reassuring. Yeah, for sure. And I remember one of our patients years ago, I think this was back in La Jolla, and the patient coordinator, you know, when the lady decided to book surgery, our patient coordinator said, what made you choose us? And she said, well, you know, I went to another doctor and had a consultation and he handed me a mirror and he said to me, now show me on your face as you look in your mirror, what bothers you? And she said, and the mirror was cracked. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) And she said, if he doesn't notice that, how can I trust him to do what I'm wanting on my face if he's handing me something broken? (laughs) And I thought, oh, you know, but you're right. Right. They're little clues. Mm -hmm. I think that whole idea of kindness, whether it's the doctors or the team and the patients, I think it sets a mood for the patients. But Going back to what you said about Dr. Olison at the beginning, what his vision was, was kind of that kindness is part of his legacy, maybe. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. He was very kind and he was a stunningly capable surgeon and he had no attitude. I mean, he had a strength and a personal power, but it didn't translate in any negative way to anybody around him. So let's say you're a patient and you have a problem, small or large, maybe after your procedure. What would you want that patient to know? That we're going to stand behind our work and we do everything we can, including additional surveys where someone might have an issue and they like us and they're reluctant to express something Then we send a survey to everybody and say, how's it going? Is there anything that has disappointed you? If yes, would you like the practice to contact you? And so we receive these and we don't receive a lot of them, but we act on them every time. And we call the patient and we say, this is not where we want you to be. And it's not where you thought you would be. And let's figure out what is that going to take? maybe in the med spots, a few units of Botox or some other something, another pass with the laser. In surgery, it may need going back to surgery for a minor revision or something, but we are always going to stand behind what we do. And I think that's, especially in terms of not just surgeons, but in the med spa, they come and go. There's hundreds of them in San Diego and you might go somewhere. And if you have a problem, what if they're not around tomorrow? And, you know, I think you, you nailed it in terms of that security as a patient that I can go back and express that things might not be quite right. And how do we fix it? What I saw, because I'm a businesswoman at heart, is as I looked at the med spa industry and considered adding this aspect to our practice, What I saw was that there was a lot of turnover of staff in med spas and that people almost accept it as something normal. Well, that was my provider, but she's no longer here or he's no longer here. And on the surgeon side, we get the same people. We have longtime relationships with them and it's very stable. And so the patients know where they are. They know exactly. And so I just looked at that whole med spa environment and said, I don't like it. I don't want to have temporary relationships with people that are important to our patients. 
And so we've really, there were a few fits and starts in learning how to do it and how to select the people correctly. But it's really, we've created a partnership with the providers in a way that ensures that they're in the best location to practice their career, that we're respectful of their families. I mean, we've had seven babies and maternity leaves (laughs) in our six years of our med spa. We're spiking the water. (laughs) A lot of babies. It's really nice though. But then it creates a humanity to the place also that's important for everyone. Yeah. And I think having such a high level of providers, like we don't take people straight out of nursing school. You know, they have Mm -hmm. to have a minimum of, I think, three years experience as an injector, as a laser technician to even step foot. And then we vet them Mm -hmm. on every procedure. So they may have done, let's say, all therapy at another practice in the past, but we want to know that they do all therapy to our standards or injections, et cetera. So One of the other things is, what would your advice be for anyone seeking plastic surgery or and a med spa provider? Like, how should they approach finding a good doctor? Well, I think you want to make sure that they are appropriately trained and credentialed. And, you know, so I have a particular affinity for plastic surgeons because plastic surgeons and brain surgeons go through about the same amount of education. So while other specialties are out already practicing, the plastic surgeons have two more residencies. And so they have made a commitment to be properly trained. And these are not simple things. You don't go to a weekend course and learn to do a breast dog. We had a patient the other day And literally, she had gone to a dentist for her breast dog. And of course, she was here because she had trouble. And you just go, what were you thinking? Mm -hmm. How could you have thought that that made sense? And so I was shocked, really, given the amount that we know now, the much better patient education and the resources for information. But people are still not considering the credentialing and the preparation enough in my mind. Well, and I think social media might have something to do with that. You know, we're going to actually do an episode on this, but do we choose our doctors from Instagram or from TikTok or Snapchat? You know, that's a personality, but is that a good surgeon and are they board certified? And, And I think in the early days of the center, we really did, like you say, have to educate the patients. But after a while... They knew what board certification was, right? but that is pretty shocking. So, okay, let's just talk about you for a second. Okay. We we know you love to work, (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but can you let us in on any other things about you outside of work? What are some of the loves? Well, I have a wonderful husband. We have two dogs and uh, their names are Charlie and Lulu and they're both black and white. And they are very funny together because one's a mid-sized poodle and the other one is a Tibetan terrier. And so he fought, one has short hair, one has long hair, (laughs) one's bigger and he follows her around and they're like entertainment. (laughs) And so they're a great part of my life. And I do a fair amount of volunteerism for many years because I was doing a lot of consulting. I was on the road a lot and I basically stopped doing volunteerism. But now I'm I'm back. I've gone on the board of Humble Design. We help Promises to Kids be, which is one of the best foster programs in the country. And we do a fair amount of children's scholarships and things within the community. And I know you do that personally and you've always done, I mean, Dr. Olison used to go down to Tijuana and tell me about that a little bit. Well, soon after we were married, we met a nun and she was an American woman from Beverly Hills who had received a calling. Her name was Mother Antonia Brenner and there was a book written about her. And so apparently she had been praying for a plastic surgeon to come and take care of her children. And her children were the prisoners in the most violent prison in Mexico, which is 
was then the and La Mesa Penitentiary in Tijuana. And so for about 10 years, Dr. Olison and I went down there about once a month and he would do anything that he could do under local. And so my background is and I wasn't a nurse. I have a degree in public administration. But when we went down there, I could open the suture and he could you know, take it out of my hand. And so Mother Antonia said to us at one point, isn't it nice to have a free nurse? And he looked at her and we had been to an auction the night before and I had bought some Chinese statues. And he said, Mother, she is not a free nurse. (laughs) She is the most expensive nurse that I have ever had. So we've all got a laugh out of that. (laughs) That's cute. Oh, one other thing. Yeah, we collect posters. So this is something that we started when we married in 81. He had one poster. I had a couple posters from my grandfather. I'm of French descent. He went to school in France. So over the years, we went to France a lot and we started collecting posters and we have them at home. We have them in our offices and in getting ready for this new office. We haven't even signed the lease and I'm already buying posters. (laughs) So it's just a fun thing that everybody can share with us. And they're really fun. I, and we have a pin on our Pinterest channel. We have a Pinterest board about art we love. And so I have, I have to add some of the- The new ones. The You're new right. ones, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so back to the charity part, I love that you and Dr. Olison have always done that in your personal lives, but you've transitioned that. And that's been a part of the La Jolla Cosmetic tradition from the beginning right. of giving back and- you know, people now are very in tuned with organizations that give back. And we've been doing that a long time and we just didn't really talk about it that much. But going back to Mm -hmm. Humble Design, that partnership, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So one of the things that we've done really for, I I think, 30 years or something is Las Patronas. Mm -hmm. And that's the jewel ball held every August in La Jolla at the Beach and Tennis Club. And the proceeds from that ball are distributed to worthy organizations throughout San Diego. And it's a wonderful group of 50 ladies. And Dr. Wheeler's wife was in that group. And now Dr. Salazar's wife is in it. And they just do marvelous things for the community. And they have the time to vet all these charities which is hard to do. You, From our point of view, we have to make sure that whatever we're giving to has been vetted. Mm-hmm. And we haven't always listed what we do, but we do a lot. Yeah. And they gave, I think over, I don't know what they're up to now, but over $400,000 last year, or I could be yeah. way off. It's about a half a million a year minimum. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I love the fact that, you know, you might be driving around and you see a van and it says generously provided by Las Patronas. And it's a, you know, they give tangible things. Right. You know, I remember San Diego Junior Theater, it was a soundboard. The kids needed a new soundboard for the theater and, you know, actual things that would help that group. We've done a lot with animals over the years, too. Mm-hmm. We had a we had a seeing eye dog that we sponsored and we've done things for various animal charities. And then the Humble Designs, we go in. So tell us about what they do and our partnership. I love this organization. When people are transitioning from homelessness, they go through like a year program. And then they are given an empty apartment. And so they don't have a bed. They don't have dishes. They just are in sleeping bags on the floor. So it's really not much of an improvement in the life they were living. And as a result, the national statistics are that about half of those people are back on the street after six months. And so the founder of Humble Design decided that she wanted to help people get furniture. So it it started as her going to her friends and neighbors and say, does anybody have a couch you're going to replace or some beds or whatever? And then over the years, what they found is that over 90% of these people are still in their homes at a year. Wow. So 
we became involved, the practice became involved, and we became personally involved. And so twice a year, we actually send a team of people down to one of what they're called installations. And we actually get to meet the family and hang the pictures and put the pillows on the sofa, put the dishes and the pots and pans in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. They go from literally having nothing to having not only a beautiful home, but really organized for living. And it's so wonderful. And we're going to, I think we're scheduled now to do it again on the Friday before Mother's Day. Yeah. And it, if any of you in our podcast audience want to help out one of these days, it's so much fun. It's so rewarding. You go in at 9.30 or 10 in the morning and by 2.30, it's like, a total transformation from an empty apartment to a beautiful, something you'd see almost on HGTV. And they have designers who donate their time. And the way they put these things together is just amazing. So you can follow them online at Humble Design. And let me just share one story from that, which is the boyfriend of one of our staff came along because you need the men to help you lift things and hang heavy pictures. So he didn't want to come. The boyfriend did not want to come. And at the end, you have a little circle and you say, what have you gotten out of this? And he said, I did not want to come here. I wanted to sleep. And he said, what I've gotten out of today is that I need to get a life. It's like, this is trouble. These people have trouble. And if I'm wandering around feeling sorry for myself, that is not right at all. And so I think. I've decided in recently about myself and my overall philosophy of life that the single characteristic that I value most in myself and I look for in others is gratitude. Mm. And so uh, someone asked me to do something the other day and my husband doesn't really want me to do it because it's a big task. And I said, Merle, how can I refuse them? We have each other. We have this wonderful business. We have this wonderful life. I have no suffering really in my life. And here's a problem and they need me. And I said, I really can't bring myself to turn them down. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful trait to have, to incorporate in your daily life, to have that gratitude and saying no, you know, everybody says, oh, you should say no to this and say no to that. Well, that's true sometimes. (laughs) I'm I'm a yes person. It's a character flaw, (laughs) but, but only in the extreme, it's it's an asset (laughs) for most of the time. (laughs) Right. And, but, you know, knowing where you can, you know, make a difference in someone's life, that's a really special thing. And I think the partnership with Humble Design, you know, it's that beauty. We are in the beauty business And we're in a beautiful office and that's thanks to you and your vision for having this beautiful place to work. That makes it a joy to come to work. The patients love it because they come in and what did you say the other day? There was one patient opened the doors from the Zymed lobby. Oh, our lobby's really happy with bright colors and big posters. And she goes, this is like coming into a speakeasy. (laughs) And what she meant is speakeasy had this plain door and then you open it and there's this big party inside. (laughs) And I just love that observation from her. Yeah. So we, you know, we make beauty, we are surrounded by beauty. And then for us to be able to give back to people in our local community and they're surrounded with beauty that makes them want to keep that lifestyle. It gives them Mm -hmm. incentive to say, oh, wow, I have my own place and these are my things. And my kids have their name over their bed. There's some permanence. They'd maybe been living in a car or, you know, in a shelter. Nothing is theirs, but in the home, it's like, oh, this is your dollhouse. Or (laughs) I mean, it's so cute and so heartwarming to see. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you follow us on social media, you'll see when we post, we show the before and the after. So it's kind of a neat way that we can give back that also very much aligns with what we do every day. So thank you, Marie. That was my pleasure. So nice. And I want to make sure everybody knows how to contact us. First, you can look in the show notes that has all the information on how to call or text or email us. And Marie, how should somebody reach out if they want to connect with you directly? 
Well, I'm M M Olison, O L E S C N at LJCSC.com. And I'm obviously on LinkedIn. And we hope that you'll subscribe or follow our podcast wherever you're listening for podcasts. And we reward that. So if you come in and show us that you've subscribed or followed us, we'll give you $25 off a $50 purchase or more. And you can get your favorite eye cream or the new neck product from Skin Medica. So we, we really just love having you as part of the Glam Fam. And so thank you again, Marie. This has been really fun. And thank you all for listening. And we hope to see you all again soon. Bye-bye. Take a screenshot of this podcast episode with your phone and show it at your consultation or appointment or mention the promo code podcast to receive $25 off any service or product of $50 or more at La Jolla Cosmetics. La Jolla Cosmetic is located just off the I-5 San Diego Freeway in the Zymed Building on the Scripps Memorial Hospital campus. To learn more, go to ljcsc.com or follow the team on Instagram at ljcsc. The La Jolla Cosmetic Podcast is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.